Hello, everybody. It's Vivian and Ha again. Uh, today, we are welcome our guest speaker, Jeff Ho, and uh, we are so pleased to have him on the show, sharing with us about his experience, his passion, and his work. So, hello, Jeff. How are you doing? Hi, Jeff. Nice. Hi. Nice to see you both. Happy to be here. Thank you yeah. for coming. So, the spotlight is uh, for our speaker. Uh, would you like to take us through your journal, your journey, and what you're doing, and why you're doing those paths? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, like everyone else, I have a, not a straight line path. I don't think there's any such thing as a straight line path, but uh, convoluted, lots of circles. Mm -hmm. um, but currently, uh, I spend my time doing basically three things. Um, I am an executive coach, and uh, so I use my psychology background. I'm a PhD in psychology, and um, I use my psychology background to do leadership coaching with executives in all different kinds of industries. Um, most, I would say healthcare, a lot of work with healthcare, especially during the pandemic, working with doctors, nursing leaders. I work with pharmaceutical companies, um, software, technology. Uh, having been based for a long time in New York City, I work with some investment banks because it's a banking city. Mm. So a lot of different industries. Um, the second thing that I do is I am the executive director of the Institute of Coaching, which is a Harvard Medical School nonprofit. And in that role, I lead a team of about 16 people. And we do research. Uh, we give grants and conduct research in the area of the science behind effective coaching. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure you're aware that coaching has become a profession in the last 10 years or so. So our goal is to invest and conduct research to raise the standard of quality mm -hmm. in coaching and also to provide education through webinars and different events, conferences, and also to build community, to have discussion groups. We have just in the past year, because of the pandemic, we've started um, discussion groups in Europe, in Asia, in South America, in the US. So it's an opportunity. A lot of coaches, as you know, work independently or they work for small companies. So they feel sometimes isolated. Mm -hmm. And so community building and learning from each other is an important component. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a very much a gift for me to work for the Harvard Institute of Coaching. Mm -hmm. And then the third thing I do is writing. And I published a book last year on leadership. And I published a book about 10 years ago on the psychology of change. So it's been a while. And I'm currently working on my next book, wow. which is about the future of leadership. And that's very much still in the proposal stages. <laughs> um, because writing a book is a very big project. So it's something that doesn't happen. And I've learned to be patient. <laughs> <laughs> um, but those are the kinds of things. So I also, and then I also do speaking engagements. Um, as a coach and as a leader of the Institute of, the, of Coaching. So a variety of things of my day-to-day -day life. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing that, uh, Jeff. Uh, but we haven't heard about the zigzag or anything. Is, uh, so that's all the things that you work currently. So allow, <laughs> allow Vivian and I to, you know, bring you back in time. All right. So uh, okay. we would want to understand, um, uh, you know, when you was a kid and then when we were young, when we were a kid, we normally we have, a, you know, a vision or idea of what we love to become. So back then, what did you love to become, Jeff? Oh, when I was a kid, I wanted to be Elton John. <laughs> How's your singing then? <laughs> I loved music mm. and I studied uh, piano. And um, yeah, I went through a few years where I wanted to be a musician. 
I wanted to move to New York and become famous, you know, blah, blah, blah. Mm. Um, I grew up in New England in a small town. Mm. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I had kind of a classic small town um, American experience and went to a small college um, in Maine and New England. And I studied psychology and philosophy and music and art. And I studied all the subjects that I liked. Mm. And I was actually a very good student. Mm. But I forgot that part of what you're supposed to go to college for is to get a job. So when I graduated from college, I had no skills. <laughs> <laughs> so my first big uh, challenge was trying to find a real job in a world that did not necessarily appreciate, you know, music. I wasn't that great. At, I wasn't good enough to be Elton John. Let's just be honest. Um, but uh, yeah, I, so I started working at a company um, that you guys have probably heard of. I actually got my very first job at a hotel mm. <laughs> and I worked actually as a front desk clerk at a Sheraton hotel. Oh. So I started at the very bottom, mm. and uh, but I'm very grateful because working at a hotel, you learn a lot about hospitality, service, customers, business, and so even though it was kind of a low job, it was also a very good um, real life experience for the mm. first couple of years, mm. and. Then I decided that I, since I had no background in business, I better go back to school and learn something. So I went back to school to get an MBA mm -hmm. and uh, I went to the University of Maryland to get my business degree. Mm -hmm. And then I actually went to work in HR and human resources. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason I did that is because I had always liked psychology. You know, mm. when I was a student, my favorite classes were, were related to psychology. I loved studying people and cultures and issues. And so when I went to get a real job, the closest thing I could get to a psychologically focused job was in human resources. So I worked in HR for probably four years, mm. five years. And, um, I worked ultimately for a consulting firm called Booz Allen and Hamilton, a big consulting firm based mm. in New York. Mm. And that's when I had my next big career change and big uh, breakdown or it wasn't like a breakdown. It was just like a wake up call. Mm. Um, I realized that to become a very successful business person at a big consulting firm, you have to be willing to sacrifice a lot mm. and uh, be willing to work with some very difficult people mm. and a lot of very big egos and a lot of competition and a lot of politics. Mm. And uh, so I decided that I didn't, I didn't really, even though I was probably giving up a very big paycheck, um, I decided that my passion was to do something more, help more in the support profession, you know, mm. to really help people. Mm. And like I said, you know, the, probably the thing that's common in all of my path is psychology mm. because cited at that point, after working with a couple of very, very difficult bosses <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, I learned later that the difficult bosses all were all, were all reminded me of my father. <laughs> <laughs> so I had a very difficult father. Um, very loving, but very difficult. Mm. And then I had some very difficult bosses that were like my father. So I decided I'd better become a psychologist so I can understand the relationships. And so I went back to school to get a PhD in psychology and started working as a psychologist and as a psychotherapist. Mm. And, uh, I actually enjoyed doing that. It was a great opportunity. It was, it was not easy. Um, because I went from having a full-time job mm. to having to figure out how to get clients and, um, you know, make money. And so it was kind of the time in my life where you try to figure out how to 
do something you love and make money at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> so it took a while, but uh, it was ultimately successful. But that also became a challenge for me because I realized that I was actually too, if you can say it this way, I was actually too results oriented for therapy. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, psychologists like to work with patients for years and years, and I was very impatient. I wanted my clients to get better very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> And so I actually found the job a little frustrating after a while. Mm. And it was at that time that I met some coaches. And I met Carol Kaufman, who's the founder of the Institute of Coaching. And she's also a psychologist. Mm. And I, I went to Boston and I went to a conference. And all of a sudden I realized, oh, my God, there's a there's an opportunity to be a coach. What is a coach? I didn't even know what a coach was. Mm. And I met Carol and she said, yeah, you can be both a psychologist and a coach and you can work in companies and you can work in hospitals. And I was like, oh my God, how do I do that? <laughs> <laughs> so, it, it, you know, it was a struggle at first because I had to make a big transition. But then I started volunteering um, at the Institute of Coaching. And that's when you meet a lot of people. I mean, my biggest advice to people is that when they want to make a career change, is to volunteer with the people that help you because that makes a huge difference to, to have the right network, mm. you know? So anyway, ultimately I made that transition to being a coach and the good news is that when I became a coach, my background in human resources from 10 years before actually came back to help because I had worked in big companies. Mm. So I had some experience working with difficult bosses and politics. And so it was actually not that difficult to become a leadership coach mm. once I realized how to make that transition. Mm. And that's probably enough for now. I mean, that's kind of the basic. Um, but it's interesting when you make me look back, you know, I started out thinking I was going to be a musician. <laughs> <laughs> and Is that room still on, Jeff? I still play the piano occasionally. Ah. Yeah. And okay. I, st I still love music. I will always love it, but go yeah, go ahead. Uh, the question is that uh, you mentioning about sacrifications. It's a trade-off process. So throughout your path, exactly a lot. What you think that you have trade off the most? And of course, you gain a lot along the path too. But what would be the trade off that you have done, and you wish you may not? <laughs> well, probably the most obvious is that I would be much richer if I had stayed in corporate. I would be very wealthy. <laughs> I could probably, I could probably, have, by now, I probably have a boat and a yacht and a, you know, but. At a certain point in life, you realize that, uh, or at least I, re not everyone, but I realized that um, doing something I love was more important to me than um, making a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And the good news is that once I committed to doing something I loved, then it became possible to make money. It just takes time, mm -hmm. right? Um, but it was a big sacrifice at mm -hmm. the time because I quit my job. And I lost my paycheck, and uh, I don't want to minimize. It was very challenging at first because you get used to having a job, you get used to having a paycheck, you get used to having uh, credit cards, and all of a sudden you decide to make a big change or you lose your job. I was lucky I made it personal choice, but some people lose their job. It can be very, very challenging. Mm. Uh, but I am a big believer in doing what you love mm. at the end of the day. Jeff, I also a big believer of doing what you love, and by listening to to your story, the whole notion of doing what you what you love, you know, getting you uh, a bit surprised when you get out of university, knowing that you lack of skills and things like that. And there are a lot of people that go into the workforce now these days that you know uh, that learning things that they think that they love. And go into the workforce, and then it, you know they had their whole slap in the face of not really ready for 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 what 
what it, the reality actually is. And a lot of them actually ended up, you know, blaming the game, blaming life, and not having the strength like you had to, um, to 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 go against adversities and relearn and 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 regroup again. So, is there any advice that uh, that you need uh, that in your journey that you would want to give to 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 those people that hey, you know, do what you love, but maybe need to blend is something. Uh, along the way to make sure that it's no big surprise when it's ready, when it comes? I think probably if I look back on the single biggest success factor for me in making those difficult transitions, it was having contacts with the right people. It was knowing people and learning from them, knowing, building. And it, you know, whenever I'm doing some kind of like career coaching and that word networking comes up, mm. people always, you know, they think, oh, well, I have to have a huge network. And then I always remind them that during my career, there were times when I actually had a very small network. Mm. It wasn't the quantity of network. It was the quality of the network. You know, it's, it's paying attention to the key people who are wise and successful and willing to help you. Mm. It may only be one or two or three people, but they can make a change in your whole life. Mm. You know, it's not, uh, it's not about making a lot of acquaintances or giving out your business card to a lot of people. Mm. It, I think for, for me, it's about paying very close attention to the value of giving and receiving from key people. Wow. So for example, when I met, you know, when I thought, oh, I would maybe like to be a coach, but I don't really have any network and I don't have any background yet. I'm just a psychologist. But, you know, I met two, two or three people. I met Carol and I went to a conference And then I realized that if I could get to know two or three of those, those people, that their wisdom and their knowledge would be just so incredibly helpful to me because they were successful as coaches. Mm. But then I, then I had to ask myself, well, why would they spend any time with me? Why, why would they be in network for me? They're very successful and I'm just a beginner. And so I realized that what I had to do was to offer to help them. Mm. So I asked them, what can I do for you? Mm. And that's when Carol and Margaret and Susan, a couple of the others, they said, well, why don't you volunteer to help us develop our education? And I said, great, I'm happy to help. Mm. So there's two, I think there's two key success factors. Number one is having a small but focused support network. Mm. And then number two, don't ask for other people to help. Look to help them. Mm. Offer help first, and then and then yes, I think the the networking these days is really really fun. You know, it's like you know exchange voucher. So every time that we went to you know a business association, it's like you know here here's a, here's my business card. Like like you say, and it didn't build the depth of the relationship, and and uh, and. Uh, You know, and then knowing a person, knowing a relationship, it's just the beginning. You know, nurturing it and make the best out of it is the beautiful part of building up a, a, a relation. So, uh, so thanks for bringing that one up, Jeff. That's, I'm sure that's a lot of uh, us. We need to to reflect on the way that we actually build friendship and build the networks uh, that we are doing currently. Um, when I look back at uh, your journey and. Um, There's a lot of pushing the boundaries that you are, you were doing. You have been doing, and you are doing at the moment too. Uh, like when you were a psychologist, you know, psychologist, right? You're trying to give the best treatment for your clients, so that your clients will, will get better faster instead of you know dragging into. <laughs> and then, and then when you got into the coaching space. It's, it's not long, but then now you're leading a, co you know, a, a, a group of people to build the next level of coaching and then have the community to dive in to make it uh, in depth. And right. so why would you chose to you know, 
you know, keep pushing the battery like that? I'm not sure. I think I've always maybe I get bored easily. I'm not sure. I I think I've always wanted to grow and learn, mm. and the best the best way to grow and learn is to plan for a future that's different from the present. Mm. In other words, not to get complacent mm. in your job or your career or your personal life, but to look to create adventure, something new. Mm. That's why I decided to move to Europe. You mm. know, my partner and I decided to leave New York and uh, try a new country after mm. the pandemic, and it was just to have a new adventure to try. Before I get too old, I want to try to really enjoy exciting new things. I think I always have a vision. I'll give you, I'll give you my coaching answer, and it relate, but it also relates to me personally, which is when people ask me about how to create a vision. Mm. My, you know, when my client asks me that question, mm. I always say to them, "I want you to fantasize about your life in 10 years." Mm. What is your ideal life in 10 years? What does it look like? What does it feel like? Where's the location? Who are you with? What are you doing? How are you spending your time? And I want you to fantasize about that. So I do the same thing. Mm. You know, I started fant two or three years ago um, when I was writing my book. I decided to do a sabbatical, and I came to Europe, and I just fell in love with being back here and. So I started having a fantasy about living in Europe, mm -hmm. and same thing with the institute. I just think about 10 years from now, what would I like to? I'd like the Institute of Coaching to be the global resource for one of the most exciting professions in the world, which is coaching. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's why I decided that I wanted to start discuss discussion groups in Asia, and in Africa, and in Europe. Not just in the United States, because everything tends to be very focused on the U.S. But my vision is for the whole world to take advantage of coaching. So I sometimes think 10 years from now, I want people to think of the Institute of Coaching as a global community, not a Harvard community or a U.S. community. Mm -hmm. So how do we do that? So we have to try, practice different things, and we have to get people to help. And so I guess the answer to your question is. Give yourself permission to fantasize about a future five years, ten years, and then have a picture mm. in your in your mind of what it would look like. Mm. Then you can start to work towards. And and that if we fantasize in the wrong kind of future and draw our future in a different way. Then it could lead us to danger, also. So how can, <laughs> am I correct, right? How can we lead into the future, which is the future is something that unknown. Right? We don't know anything in the in the future. We don't know if whether our capacity can get us there. So fantasy might get us to the right direction, might get us to the wrong direction, also. So where can we find a fine line to make sure that whatever we find, you know, our fantasy is not gonna give us trouble? So. I think the most important thing in that context is to be open to feedback. Open to feedbacks. Right. Because you do not create a company or a family or a community or a nonprofit alone. Mm. You do it with other people. Mm. And you know, I work with senior executives at companies all over the world, and I. When I'm coaching them, one of the very first things I ask them is, "How do they get feedback from their colleagues, from their staff, from their customers? How do they get feedback?" Mm -hmm. You'd be surprised. Many of them don't. They don't get feedback. They mm -hmm. they don't even understand the question. They're like, "Oh, I never thought about that. I should get feedback." I'm like, "Yes, you should get feedback from every part of your life." You should get feedback from your wife and from your friends and from your children, and from your customers and from your employees. And the way you get feedback from all those different stakeholders is quite different, mm. right? You know, getting feedback from your customers is different from getting feedback from your kids. But 
it's important because otherwise it can, you can go the wrong path, like you said. Mm. And that's a very egotistical path. That's a very narcissistic path. Mm. It's short, it's very, and it can also be very lonely. Yeah. So I'm a very, very big believer in creating feedback loops in your life. Mm. Wow. Jeff, and we would like to know how did you how did you come up with the idea writing flex? You know, how, how that whole journey all began though. Can you share? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, like anything else, I think when you have an idea, it kind of pops out of nowhere. So mm. the idea for the framework that I wrote about actually came to me all in one vision, mm. which, which often happens with me. I'll think of the entire thing all at once. So the, the six dimensions that I wound up writing about, it all came to me all very quickly. Mm. But then I needed to get feedback. Mm. <laughs> exactly what we were just talking about. You can have a wonderful idea and a great framework and be completely wrong. Mm. So once I had this idea in my mind that the, the uh, competencies or the effectiveness of leadership was changing dramatically, mm. then I went out to do some research. And I did focus groups with colleagues, coaches at the Institute of Coaching. I did surveys about what the uh, other coaches are working on with their clients. So I looked to reinforce whether or not I was on the right track. Mm. And it was through the combination of having my own ideas about my own practice and what was changing. You know, I was basically seeing the leaders change, different demographics, younger leaders, millennials, different cultures, more women in leadership roles, a lot more variety. And some of the old traditional ways of leading We're just not working anymore. Mm. So that's where I realized that we needed to, and also coaching, you know, there's a, there's a need for leaders to be able to understand the value of coaching mm. as recipients of coaching, but also as coaches themselves. Mm. So that was the original idea was to write about the transformation basically of leadership over the last five to ten years and it started with my own experience my own practice mm. and then but I reinforced it by getting feedback from a lot of research so out of that six things in 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 the model which one do you think that that is the most important that leader needs to apply right now though oh that's a hard question because uh, they're all important mm. Um, yeah, that's difficult. I would say maybe two things come to mind mm. um, because we've just come through a very difficult time with the pandemic and uh, there's been a lot of uh, illness and a lot of suffering in people's families. Um, I think there is a real need for leaders to develop compassion, compassion. and to develop the ability to have empathy and bring wellness and balance into workplaces. Mm. And You know, I think when you think about the connection between health and wellness, productivity, basically it comes down to having leaders have more emotional intelligence mm. and, and be better at creating safe, collaborative environments. Mm. So I would, two of my dimensions are emotional agility, emotional intelligence, and collaborative, collaborate, collaboration skills. Mm. And I think those are probably the two most important. But recently, uh, I think in 2021, in the middle of 2021, up until now, we hear a lot about the word intention. 
and then intentionality also is a one that one of one of the 16 that you put in there what did you mean by intentionality though because it i kept hearing it in every leadership workshop in every newsletter <laughs> that came out in almost every client that we're serving also the same word intention having your intention of doing things and uh, and i think that 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 concept was coined back in the in the in the army long ago you know like if i if i write it correctly long ago it's a it's an army concept but then now it, it, it applied to the leadership concept what did you mean by intentionality uh, jeff i mean in my case what i was looking at is the um, quality of their communication mm. of their vision the quality of the communicating that you do as a leader is key to your success mm. you know you have to be able to make good decisions which is the flexibility domain mm. and you have to build an environment or a culture of engagement and collaboration but you also have to be very intentional about your communication Mm. And what I found is too many of my clients, um, they spend their focus on data. Mm. You know, the, the, the data side of things has become um, kind of taken over our narrative. And everything is always about data, big data, small data, data this, data that, data mm. science, data analysis, analytics. And <clears throat> it's it's helpful because financial data, customer data, marketing data, those are all very valuable. Mm. You know, when I work with doctors, they need diagnostic data, they need medical data, science, they need data for research. So I'm not saying that data is not really important, but here's the thing. Mm. Data does not inspire people. Yep. You cannot change the world with data. Mm. You cannot get up in front of your team as a leader and give them lots of numbers and facts and figures and analysis and expect them to walk out of the room rah, 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 excited, thrilled, motivated, engaged. It's not going to happen. Mm. Human beings are motivated and inspired by stories which is what you're doing. You're collecting stories. You asked me about my story. Thank you. Human, be human beings connect to real life stories. And that's what you have to be intentional about. You have to be intentional to share the story, the why, the reason, the purpose, the value. Why should I care? Not that data is not important, but my heart and my soul and my passion mm. Is equally is equally important so when you think about being intentional you need to have both have a passionate story have something you care about have something that matters to you and then on top of that have good data mm. so that's what I was writing about with intentionality Intention. is to make sure that you're incorporating both aspirational story narrative and facts and figures thank you for sharing that so uh, i i would need to ask you this hard question and it's also okay. about the intentionality during the pandemic times i think that uh, leaders has learned a lot of things and they also had a good intention to do a lot of good things and that's where we start seeing the promotion of well-being where and, and happiness and organization however in the past two months, we've been collectively receiving data. And, and, and again, data doesn't mean anything, but it's a sign to us that, you know, what is the feedbacks from the people around. And, sure. uh, and uh, the data shows that, um, you know, my employees are concerning about the leaders going back to the old behavior. And, and, and now, you know, meetings are becoming excessive, you know, and then, you know, people are talking about targets and pressures that start to go back to corporations already. And people go back to office and what promised two years ago during the pandemic was basically forgotten. So, <laughs> yes. So, um, 
a lot of that leading to a, a, a um, you know, a question, a simple question is, it, would that, you know, bring everything back to the old normal, uh, an old behavior or leadership in the organization will go back to where it was before? Uh, in your opinion, you work with a lot of executive and a lot of leaders. Do you see the intention to continue this forward? Uh, it's very difficult to predict. I don't know the future, but um, I would say the successful organizations, mm. the successful leaders will learn from the pandemic mm -hmm. and will maintain the trajectory, the path of connecting wellness to productivity and in creating an environment where there's more balance. But I cannot predict. I think you're right. There are definitely some environments where um, there's a lot of pressure to go back to working hard and there's uh, economic stress because of the supply chain issues mm. and political problems in Europe. And so there's a, there's a lot of anxiety that causes some leaders to put a lot of pressure mm. um, on their workers. But I think that's going to backfire. Mm. And that's why, at least in the United States, we have this big uh, resignation. You know, a lot mm. of people are just basically saying, I'm not going to do it anymore. Mm. Yep. <laughs> Um, so, you know, I'm cautiously optimistic that in some industries, the next generation of leaders will be more, uh, in tune with the connection between productivity mm. and satisfaction and wellness, mm. but yeah, some of them won't. Mm. And, uh, I think they will not succeed ultimately. So. It's an opportunity for coaches because I think many of many of my clients are struggling. Mm -hmm. Senior executive clients kind of struggling. Oh, I want them all back in the office. I want everybody back. I want them all to be in the office from eight o'clock in the morning until five o'clock in the afternoon. And I'm like, uh, I think they're probably all going to resign if you do that. <laughs> <laughs> so can we can we maybe talk about a little more flexibility? Mm. Um, and then I, I guess the, the final thing I would say about this question is what's really important is for leaders to build trust mm. with their people. Mm. Because the big mistake I think that many leaders made in the past, and it's one of the reasons I wrote my book, mm. is that they did not trust that people want to succeed, people want to work hard, people are actually very well intentioned. Mm. They, they felt like they had to be watching them all the time. Mm. You know, they have to be on the clock, as they say in the US. And the, the studies show that the vast majority of people, if you give them autonomy and if you trust them, mm. are actually very, very hard working and committed. Mm. So trust, you know, I tell my clients, trust your people, mm. empower them. Mm. I see. Jeff, but then we yeah. put a lot, uh, sorry, Vivian, go ahead. Yeah, it was just linked to the quiet revolutions that you brought about the rise of the beta uh, leadership. Is there some connections with that kind of transformations? Yeah, because the biggest fundamental difference between what I call an alpha style leader and a beta style leader is that an alpha leader, which is very important to have during an emergency. Mm -hmm. So I'm not against alpha. Alpha is very helpful when you have an urgent situation, when you have a disaster, when you have a really important decision, you want someone who has alpha. So, so my book is very balanced. Mm -hmm. But beta is about building consensus and listening and curiosity. And it takes a little bit more time. And it also means respecting quieter people. Sometimes the introverted person has the best idea. Mm. So leaders that are a little more beta are the ones that make sure the best example is the alpha leader comes in to make a decision with the team. And she already has decided, she asks for input, doesn't really listen, 
and then says, ah, oh, thanks, I made a decision. Hmm. The beta leader comes in and says, I have an idea, I have my perspective, I have my point of view, but I really want to hear from everyone before we make a decision. Mm. So I'm going to go around the room and I want every single person to say something. Mm. I want to hear from every person, every extrovert, every introvert, every woman, every man, every person from Asia, every person from America. I want to hear from everyone. Mm. Now, it takes longer to do that. Mm. But if your goal is creativity and your goal is innovation, then you want to do that because you want people to get excited, to be heard, to be a participant. And that's the beta style. Mm. And as I said, sometimes you need alpha, but in today's world, we need more beta. Mm. And we need to respect the value of both. Mm. So hopefully that. Is that linked to the book that you are working on at the moment, The Future of Leadership? Yes, but I'll tell you the future of leadership is what I call meta leadership. Meta, uh huh. And what is that? <laughs> <laughs> it is it is the ability to rise above alpha and beta. Ah. Because as much as it's helpful to think of people as introvert or extrovert or left brain and right brain and alpha and beta. Those are also silos. Those are also categories. Mm. And in the future, as humans, we need to go beyond categories. Mm. And we need, we need to actually step above and, and outside and think more systemic. Mm. We need to think about like the ecology, the sustainability, the downstream impacts of our decisions. So when I say meta leadership, it's really about being able to reflect as a leader on all the different parts of the system mm. that you're impact. Ah. So that's the future. I'm working on it. <laughs> wow, I'm so excited about that. Um, earlier today, you mentioned about the, the word that I really like is give and take. And I feel like that the world is not also fair on leaders. So every, you know, every, 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 hit every bullet actually you know most of the time is on leaders and you know the gain the failures of leaders but then also as employees we need to be we take part of that journey also so is there anything uh, you know if we put the pressure on the leader and on the organization basically the, the ship we've seen all together and we're not going to be coming out of that winning so is there any advice that you think that we can we should give you to the employees in 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 the skills that they need to really, really, really learn now so that they can take on the journey together with their leaders and make their works become more meaningful for everybody, not just for, for themselves. Yeah, I think the most important thing and the, the biggest opportunity in my lifetime mm -hmm. about leadership is that it's no longer just at the top. Mm. Maybe in the political world, we hear about the autocrats, you know, the crazy stuff that's going on. But in organizations, startups and fast growing companies, leadership is something that can emerge from anywhere inside the organization. Mm. So I would be asking two questions. I would ask my leader clients who are at the top to be looking for leaders throughout the organization. Where is the next generation? Every single client that I have that's a senior CEO or very senior, I always ask them, what are you doing to develop the next generation and the next generation and the next generation of leaders mm -hmm. all the way through? Mm -hmm. So from the top to think about the future leaders. Mm -hmm. And then the second question is, if you are at the bottom or you are in the middle or you are growing early in your career, how can you be a leader now, mm -hmm. today? What can you volunteer to lead? You know, I'll leave you with an example. I have a client a software company that I worked with mm -hmm. and the CEO is a 10 year old company that's growing. They have about 300 employees. 
And the CEO wanted to create a culture and a values and all of that. And I said, well, rather than doing that just at the top, why don't you ask the employees, get, him, get, the, get the people in the company involved in the conversation? Mm-hmm. What is our culture that we want? What are the values we want? And he said to me, yeah, but I don't have time to do that. I just, I'm, I'm too busy, you know, running the company. And I said, well, why don't you put together a group of cross-functional employees and get conversations going? And, and he said, yeah, but who's going to run it? And I said, <laughs> why don't you ask a volunteer at the lower level of the company? And he said, I can't do that. That's a young person. Those people are too young. And I said, why not? And then he thought about it for a minute and he said, well, I'll give it a try. I'm not sure, but I'll give it a try. Uh, anyway, I'll give you the punchline. Six months later, he has a series of conversations running throughout the company that are being led by a 24-year-old woman from Venezuela. Wow. This is in Boston. Uh, and this young Hispanic Latina is brilliant. She is working hard, running conversations, and she goes up to the CEO and she gives him all the feedback. And he said to me, Jeff, I didn't even know we had people in the company like this. And I said, hello. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Leaders are at every level. mm. It's never too early to discover the leaders in the company. Yep. Thank you so much for for changing one person at a time like that because that change <laughs> leader will change will make a lot of positive change to the employees that he is responsible for and the family of those employees also so one good at a time is our principle also yeah, yeah. Jeffrey right. I, I would like to ask a bizarre question to end our conversation today and because that is a <laughs> promise that I made to my uh, to my uh, communication coach right so uh, um, what is your, your vision for the next 10 years? Would you travel to Asia? Because your, your last time you asked the vision for your, your next 10 years and you moved to Netherlands already. So uh, who knows, <laughs> the, the next time you ask the 10-year the question, you're going to come to Vietnam and live in Ho Chi Minh City and be my neighbor. So never know. Right? Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. So what is that? Yeah. I, you know, it's a great question. I um, I would actually love to live in Asia. I'm not sure. It would be very hard to pick the right place. Um, I'll be honest with you because I don't want to insult Vietnam. I love Vietnam. But my favorite, favorite city that I ever visited was in Laos, ah. Luang Prabang. Ah. Absolutely beautiful city. Mm. Um, very close to Vietnam, actually. Mm. Uh, but and I loved Singapore and I love Tokyo. Uh, I I don't know. I mean, vision for the future, definitely to live in another part of the world. So yes, okay, maybe and and maybe in Asia. Um, Is it yes? <laughs> yeah, I'm definitely open to it. Mm-hmm. And I guess to. Uh, to be able to be a mentor, you know, I think I think of myself as reaching a point in my life now where I can give back. Wow. And uh, we just started doing pro bono coaching in Africa. Mm. And I just did a talk um, in Zimbabwe for a group of companies. There's so many places where we can bring coaching. Mm. So I think my vision it may involve living in another part of the world, but I do think that my fundamental vision is to bring the value of coaching to places that have not had as much opportunity mm. to grow and learn and to really bring a sense of equality um, so that we're basically growing leaders all over the world, not just in the United States, not just in Europe, wow. but everywhere. You know, that's my. Thank you so much for sharing that. And we really appreciate the story that you bring to the show today, sharing your wisdom and your experience. And uh, we, we, it's been six years you haven't been back to Vietnam. So hopefully that you and your partner will spend some time here in, in our country. 
And the next time if it okay. happens, then Vivian and I will be so happy to take you around town and, and maybe uh, have a good coffee all together. A tea. <laughs> and go to Da Nang. I have to go to Da Nang, right? Yeah, my hometown. <laughs> so if you go there, I will, we definitely will fly back there and see you. <laughs> All right. I look forward to it. Mm. All right. Jeffrey, thank Good you so you. much. Thank you very, very much. It's lovely to see you. It's lovely to hear the story that you share. And we really appreciate that. Uh, we're in touch with your, uh, your vision. And uh, and uh, it also helped me and Vivi and, and a lot of our audience to rethink what we do and how we can break our, you know, push our boundaries to do something bigger than we think we could do. So thank you for setting the example for us. Okay. Great. My pleasure. Best of luck with your vision. Thank you. Let's do it together. Let's do it together. That's what I love. Thank you very much. All right. Yeah. Take care. You take care. Thank, thank you. you. Bye-bye.